Egypt is a country of profound and polar confidation. It's also a country I was pleased to discover that is incredibly rich in wildlife. The first charismatic creature we met was the carpenter bee. Our original plan to travel up the Nile and film the wildlife we encountered en route unfortunately fell through, but when we arrived in Aswan we were greeted by a vast number of different species. One of the first to come crawling, quite literally, out of the woodwork was the African skink. The skink family of lizards are immediately notable compared to their relatives for their disproportionately small limbs for their body size. Indeed, some species, although none that we encountered, have lost their limbs entirely. Identification is always a little tricky with lizards, but this species takes it further than most. They can have incredibly different colour morphs, and some individuals do away with the stripes entirely. At up to 20 centimetres long though, these lizards do stand out, particularly when their light catches their tails just right, as these can shine almost electric blue under the right conditions. They are quite flighty lizards, as a rule which means that getting footage of them, not scarpering into or out of the focal plane, is quite a challenge at times. Where Egypt really seems to come alive though is in its bird species. To my admittedly untrained and profoundly European eye, they are incredibly varied and really quite characterful. Even the ostensibly common bulbul and common red start seemed exotic to me in their appearance or behaviour. However, it soon became very much apparent that even species well known within Europe and indeed known worldwide for their intelligence could surprise me with their ability to manipulate objects. This hooded crow, for example, had acquired some form of baked good from somewhere and Rather than attempting to peck at it directly, because it was really quite hard, it was instead soaking it in the river water and pecking the bits off as they became soft enough to eat. The next species we encountered was one that had often been described to me by my father, but despite occasional visits to Southern Europe, is one that I had never managed to encounter myself. I'm not going to pretend that I wasn't immediately drawn to this bird. Between its striking appearance and really quite unusual behaviour, I failed to see how anyone could be anything other than impressed. The laughing dove, however, and its unusual call, is one I could absolutely do without hearing again. And last, but for my money, most assuredly not the least of the small birds, we have the sunbirds. I have, it must be said, a somewhat complicated relationship with this family of birds. But you'll need to wait for our episode on South Africa to find out more. With the benefit of hindsight, I really shouldn't have been surprised that the Nile, the only significant body of fresh water for many, many miles in any direction, was home to such a vast array of different water birds. Some of them, like this little egret, are familiar to viewers from the UK, but others, despite their superficial similarities, are incredibly exotic, and in some respects the most surprising aspect is their ubiquity. For example, this pied kingfisher was one of at least a dozen visible in a very small stretch of water just downstream of the Aswan Dam. Their behaviours are remarkably similar to those of European kingfishers in their tendency to find a perch and use it as a literal jumping off point. 
Although, as you can see here, they are also quite adept at hunting from the wing, hovering in place until they are certain of their target before diving to strike. It is the wading birds of the Nile, though, that really exemplify their awesome biodiversity on display. This little bittern, with its moderate size and, and large splayed feet, is very well adapted to wading across the lily pads, for example. And this much smaller common moorhen paddles around within the reeds, feeding on the weeds themselves and the small invertebrates clinging to them. And the glossy ibis probes the shoreline features buried in the mud. Share the shoreline with the glossy ibis, try saying that five times fast, is the sandpiper. And I'm not even going to remotely pretend that I don't adore these rather rotund little birds and their peculiar waggling walk. It has been proposed that this unusual method of locomotion can actually draw worms and the like to the surface for the sandpiper to eat, but we saw little evidence of this. The river clearly had sufficient fish stocks to support quite a large population of wading birds, including this small cormorant colony, most of whom would periodically throughout the day disappear for up to an hour at a time, presumably to hunt in different locations, but always returning to this one rock. And lastly, we spotted two herons who were particularly striking for very different reasons. This green heron, with its gorgeous coloration and patterns on its wings, and the purple heron. While not the largest of the family, it is quite large and has an extraordinarily long neck. And of course, anywhere that has such a staggering diversity of species to be preyed on is inevitably going to have predators. And much like the wading birds of Aswan, there was a great degree of specialization in the predators that we observed. This osprey, for example, is a fish eater, putting it in direct competition with many of those wading birds. Although I imagine the osprey itself is unconcerned by this fact. In fact, given its size, I don't think many things do concern the osprey a great deal, except perhaps for other larger birds of prey. Fortunately, this western marsh harrier is unlikely to be on that list, as they generally feed on small birds, mammals, lizards and so forth. Where most of the previous large birds had been spotted occasionally in ones or maybe twos, the black kites in Aswan were everywhere. At certain times throughout the day, a, I hesitate to use the word flock, swarm almost feels more appropriate, would rise above the city before the birds would disperse and presumably go and hunt or, more likely, scavenge elsewhere. Moving up in size, we find the griffin vulture, or more properly, the Eurasian griffin vulture. Even from our vantage point several hundred metres away across the Nile, these birds are awe-inspiringly big, with a wingspan of up to 2.8 metres and weighing, in extreme cases, up to 15 kilograms. There really isn't a lot in the sky that will threaten a griffin vulture. On the flip side, however, there's not a lot that they will threaten either. Like many vultures, they are predominantly scavengers. While most of our filming did take place along the Nile, I would be remiss not to have marked that other areas of Egypt have their own absolutely fascinating wildlife and ecosystems. As a case in point, this little owl, with its backdrop of highly weathered limestone blocks, could be anywhere in the world. It was, in fact, on one of the Great Pyramids, just outside Cairo. This litter of puppies of one of the feral dogs that can be seen almost anywhere in Cairo were exploring outside their den almost at the feet of the Sphinx. And I'm just going to leave this footage running with the credits.